Hello and welcome to this week's so What Were They Thinking? Among the news items we have for you this week, now the key ingredient leading to the outbreak of food poisoning at McDonald's has been identified, and surprisingly enough, McDonald's is actually considered food and therefore poisoning. Nanoparticle therapy for atherosclerosis or plaque buildup in your arteries. The first instance of pigs being infected with avian influenza, which should perhaps now be considered swine influenza. A preprint looking at one of the world's oldest living organisms, the panda aspen clone. One of the uh, fathers of DNA uh, has uh, made some rather scandalous statements over recent years and as a result uh, been uh, sort of punished. And a uh, example of how it is that uh, AI is not going to doom us just yet. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. Let's start with the outbreak of food poisoning across a number of states in the USA. So far, the CDC has found that at least 90 people have been infected by E. coli. Just about every one of these instances can be traced back to eating at McDonald's, and eating what they serve is perhaps a generous description for what it is. What McDonald's provides is recongealed, reconstituted, and somehow homogenized who knows what that was once part of an animal. Unfortunately, in this case, it's not part of an animal we can blame this time, it is onions. Another reason why they make you cry, um, other than being similar to ogres. Um, but other than that, it is that they're making you sick. This is important because not only does McDonald's now have to recall their meals, and particularly the quarter pounder where it was used extensively, but so does the supplier of this, Taylor Farms. This is going to affect more than just McDonald's. In fact, it's going to affect a number of restaurants across dozens of US states because, well, we don't know which of the onions are contaminated and which are not. In a uh, similar piece of news, but arguably worse, it's a very silly article coming out of nature. And we say article understand in terms of it being similar to a blog post and not a peer-reviewed article. What it looks at is claims that providing fecal contamination in a mother's breast milk and can help infants who are delivered by cesarean section. This sounds like a recipe for food poisoning, and arguably it should be, mostly because the study is really small. 31 individuals. Let's be clear about this. 31 people are not enough for anything other than possibly a game of football. And even then, you're not going to make it a competitive game, it's just a friendly match between two teams. The other issue is that the researchers are claiming that their study is successful. Not because they've actually completed the study. It's a two year long affair, so they're nowhere near finishing it. But because it matches with a non-controlled group study that they previously conducted. A study that, by that standard, has no particular merit other than to say, maybe you should look into this further and in an actual proper scientific approach. Not... yeah. Anyway, the other important part of this is we started saying that it's 31 babies, but what's important here is only 15 of those babies received the treatment, 16 got the placebo, so it is effectively two teams playing a friendly match and not competitively. As a result, you're not going to draw a lot out of this pilot study no matter what you might think, and importantly, as the article itself says, don't try this at home. As much as you might be tempted, no, this will cause problems for you and the baby, because in order to get just 31 people, and remembering only 15 had been given the treatment, they had to screen three times that number, and of that three times greater number, the majority were excluded due to pathogenic bacteria and other issues that excluded them. In other medical news, although this time arguably useful, we have it nanoparticles for atherosclerosis, or what is commonly called plaques in your arteries. Now, plaques in your arteries are generally a result of eating a high fat and delicious diet. Generally speaking, the more calories there is, the more deliciousness points there are in food. Anyway, the key thing here is not just that you have a deliciousness in your food, but that it tends to be high cholesterol and other fats. These will inevitably and eventually cause various damage to the lining of your blood vessels, 
and this lining gets damaged, there's a immunological and inflammatory response. This then leads to uh, cells building up inside of it. These cells build up, and you eventually get a plaque. A very simplified version of things. Atherosclerosis is basically an example of the human body trying to fix something and making it worse. It's a uh, microcosm of humanity as a whole, where we try and fix things and make them worse. What happens here is that we're trying to exacerbate that process even further again, because those nanoparticles that are incredibly tiny have a small amount of drug in them, and this activates immune cells, and when they're activated, it helps to further reduce the uh, plaque size. It is worth us very, very clearly pointing this out, that this is conducted in pigs and has definitely not been proved in humans, so take it with a lot of salt. We would say grain, but a grain won't cut it. You basically need a small salt mine. While this may sound like a miracle cure for atherosclerosis, there is a big caveat to the entire idea. The approach and treatment is something called efferocytosis, basically removing of dead and damaged cells that contribute to the plaque development. This is all well and good, but remembering, you are essentially overactivating the immune system to some extent, causing it to target those cells, and this could, and understands a pretty major caveat, and a very big qualifier, target red blood cells, leading to anemia, and uh, possibly issues to do with your own body targeting your own red blood cells and ultimately causing uh, more complicated issues down the track. But so far, the evidence doesn't show that that's happening. Yet. There is a case, however, to be made that, uh, well, Possibly dying from anemia is far better than definitely dying from some sort of infarct, such as a stroke or heart attack. In a related piece of dietary news, there's a article that claims a certain dietary fibers can have the same effects or similar effects to a Zempic. A Zempic being that revolutionary new drug that's supposed to make you lose weight like crazy and keep it off, and possibly make you buy uh, off-brand versions online and wind up with some sort of who knows what in your body that causes all sorts of complications. This is where the uh, particular fiber called beta-glucan is said to help, because it can similarly control blood sugar levels. And much like the study in atherosclerosis, this is also purely animal-based, but this time it's mice rather than pigs. The other important thing here is that it's a very short-term study, because they're looking at a period of about 18 weeks. 18 weeks, or just under half a year, isn't anywhere near enough time to figure out whether or not this does anything for a human. But for a mouse, it's actually a fairly long time frame. It's the equivalent of several years of human study, if you look at the rough lifetime comparison. Where Zempic looks at uh, targeting your own body and how your own cells deal with uh, particularly blood glucose, uh, this is instead looking at the bacteria within your body and trying to see whether or not you can't uh, tinker with the various bacteria, and particularly Ilia bacterium that is inside your small intestine, or in this case inside the small intestine of mice. Uh, by doing this, they found that they can uh, particularly, let's say, encourage the production of certain uh, byproducts of metabolism by those bacteria, and this includes something like butyrates. These are similar, let's say, to things like glucon-like peptide, of which Zempic is a mimic. And as such, they're arguing that with higher dietary fiber, you could in theory end up with a similar effect. We would however argue that a similar effect could also be the result of being constipated from having so much fiber in your diet that you can't poop anymore. And when you try to poop, it's really painful, therefore you don't eat as much. It's a different approach, but the same outcome. Or what we can't say is a different approach with the same outcome, because it's actually just the same outcome, is infection by pigs with avian influenza. So we can now add pigs to the list of cows, seals, other birds, of various humans who have possibly been directly infected but not cross-infected thankfully, and a list could arguably keep going on. And this is a worry. Understand, we're not so worried about the long list. That's terrifying of its own accord. No, what we're worried about is that pigs are very close to humans, and depending on how you view police, are the same thing as a human, which is both an insult to pigs and humans. The issue here is that because pigs are so close to humans, infecting them brings the virus that much closer to infecting us. And worse yet, because you now have both a poultry in the form of chickens, ducks, etc., and infection of pigs, cows, etc., 
it is entirely possible that it will mutate, meaning it becomes much more capable of getting into some sort of mammal, like humans. And then, if we're really unlucky, between humans. This is why the United States Department of Agriculture found the pigs to start with. Now, understand, we're talking about one pig. And this one pig was infected only days after poultry on the same farm were found to be infected with the avian influenza virus, the H5N1 variant. The CDC says that they've euthanized the pig that was infected along with four others on the farm for additional diagnostic analysis. And we're wondering if that diagnostic analysis involves some sort of frying pan, butter, some eggs, and possibly some muffins. But no, no, there's actually a legitimate reason to run diagnostic testing, partly to look at the virus itself and see whether or not there are issues around mutations, whether or not it's a particular issue to do with the pig, and so on, but nonetheless, we strongly suspect the four other pigs, well, that's a different story. In uh, different animal news, uh, we have a uh, exercise in, well, theoretically writing, evolution, and the ape. Uh, the ape is in humans and monkeys. The question is whether or not you have a, enough monkeys, enough typewriters, and enough time, uh, will said monkeys eventually complete the works of Shakespeare. This is a thousand monkeys working at a thousand typewriters. Soon, they'll have written the greatest novel known to man. Let's see. It was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. You stupid monkey. <laughs> you shut up. Uh, the answer is uh, no. At least mathematicians say no. And mathematicians really know their stuff. Except when they have to ask you to find their ex, because they never seem to be able to do that for some reason. Nonetheless, the mathematicians, this being Stephen Woodcock and Jay Folletta from the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia, looked at the numbers and found that there isn't enough time in the entire estimated lifespan of the universe for this to work. And that's just for Hamlet, let alone the collected works of Shakespeare, which are far more extensive. Of course, we're starting with the premise here that we have an infinite number of monkeys, infinite amount of time, and infinite number of typewriters. Without any one of these things, well, we get to this situation. That is, if you have a finite number of monkeys with infinite time, they won't have a very high probability of not only stringing together the necessary letters, words, and then eventually sentences, but put them in order in totality. And the mathematicians actually took the uh, matter rather, let's say, seriously, because they literally used the current minimum number of monkeys that could possibly exist, that being one, and the maximum theoretical number of monkeys that currently exist at 200,000. And then tried to figure out whether or not, with a number of keystrokes per second or per minute, along with everything else, we could eventually get that result. And as we said at the very start of this, no, that's pretty much a, the end of it. The chances of getting, say, the word banana is maybe 5%, and that's in the chimpanzee or monkey's entire lifetime when you consider that there are somewhere in the range of 880,000 words in the works of Shakespeare, and with 200,000 chimps, and you now need to look at numbers that get into ridiculously, ridiculously small probabilities. Understand, we're going to give you the number here, just so you understand, and we're not actually going to read it out because it uses an exponential. It's 6.4 by 10 to the negative Seven four four eight two five four. That's getting as close to zero in practical terms as you could possibly be without being zero. Yeah. Okay, if we have a relatively short lifespan for monkeys, what about if you look at a much longer lived organism? And this is where an examination of one of the oldest organisms on Earth, that being the Panda Aspen clone, is interesting. Understand, this is preprint, so take what we say with a lot of salt, because it hasn't been properly peer-reviewed. The work is looking at a very large tree, basically. Understand, it's a single aspen, but it's growing over somewhere around 106 acres, or roughly 42.6 hectares in Utah, America. That's a really big tree. But what's important here is that every one of it it's, is a clone. Trees that have fallen over and started growing up like a raft for bonsai, trees that had roots growing out and then a sucker has grown up from there, and so on. What they found is that overall there isn't a 
necessarily a lot of variation, as you would expect for a clone, although for a single organism there is, with roughly 22,000 variants. So you can tell which of these is a clone of the original and which is from something else. In fact, as they show, the clustering is almost perfect. While we're not going to go into great detail on all of the discoveries, the one that we found particularly interesting is that of all the parts of the tree that have mutations, the leaves develop mutations at a far greater rate than the roots or bark does, indicating that there is a certain amount of protection in the other tissues compared to leaves, particularly regarding mutations and the ability of the DNA to regulate and remove those mutations as they occur. In other cloning news, we have what is a basically human voice cloning, although this has been around for quite a while now. Understand, this is a fairly old thing. There was a attempt a while back to have Jordan Peterson say anything and everything you wanted. You would type it out, and it would read it out to you in his voice, almost perfectly. Well, now it has been uh, diversified with the number of individuals who can be voice cloned, extending at a greater and greater rate every day. But this is considered a, a variation on the deep fake. Uh, that is where you have a... a moving image, sound, voice, pictures, etc, uh, artificially created, and it's so perfectly created that it's very hard to distinguish from whether or not it's real or something that's been created artificially. The challenge with it now is not necessarily that you need a, a lot of content. For example, the Jordan Peterson example required analyzing the largely collected works he has on YouTube, but for the average individual, well, that's just way too much work and you are unlikely to have access to that many samples. A newer technology requires as little as just three seconds. And depending on the source you go with, there is actually a apparently surprising amount of individuals who fall for these sorts of deep fakes. Anywhere between somewhere around 20% in the UK, up to or down to, depending on how you want to look at this, somewhere in the range of about 1% of Australians. And next we go to what is arguably very old news, but not old in terms of it actually being ancient, rather it's just about someone very old. It's about James Watson and various claims that he's not only a racist, but that, well, he's a bigot, he's a research stealer, that he lacks integrity, so on and so forth. The first issue we're going to raise is the man is roughly 96 to 98 years old now from memory, and so his opinion on various things like race are probably going to be rather dated, mostly because when he grew up, a lot of what he had ingrained in him as he grew up was kind of bigoted and racist. Not necessarily an excuse, but certainly something to be aware of when people say, well, he's a terrible human being. Yeah, anyone growing up at that time probably has traits that aren't particularly, let's say, popular today. But understand, he's not just coming out of nowhere to say this. He does argue that there is a link between race, intelligence, melanin content in skin, uh, promiscuity, and a lot more. Uh, the other claims about him, such as stealing work from individuals, well, that tends to be rather more, uh, let's say, controversial and, well, not necessarily well established. And this brings us to the problem here. What he's being accused of is, arguably, not necessarily directly related to his work that he was doing. For example, he was for a time working with the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Essentially, once he did his initial work, particularly into DNA, he then went on to do other work with them, and then gradually went on to have effectively an honorary role where he was a consultant. Now, it's very important for us to say that his work is to be appreciated for what it is. There's undeniable evidence to show that what he did, and how much use it's been to humanity since, is definitively there. Uh, this is not to say that everything about him is certainly on board. Uh, for example, there's a lot of controversy around the Rosalind Franklin work and her contribution to the identification of DNA. But for now, let's just focus on the key issue here. The guy has at least a basis for what he says. The basis for what he says can definitely be argued, uh, particularly in academic terms, and more than that, it doesn't affect his ability to do his job, not outright anyway. Now it's true that if you go into the laboratory and you are someone who's going to be particularly touchy about this, you may not be very happy, but 
that's not necessarily something you can do anything about. It is simply a reality that any role you go into it will have various people that you could sit there and go, what an ass. Now, to be clear, we don't necessarily agree with his opinion that black people are less intelligent than white people, mostly because there are various issues to deal with such a broad and, let's say, a blanket assertion for any particular race, and it certainly doesn't hold in terms of who actually performs best overall. But it also doesn't reflect issues around demographics, particularly things like the kind of assessments that are being conducted, access to education, socioeconomics, and so on and so forth, all of which you would need to adjust for before making any assertion of that kind, something that he doesn't appear to have done. This brings us to how Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory handled this situation, and it is to say the least, poorly. The guy was acting as an emeritus professor there and providing guidance and input, something somebody with four or more decades of experience probably has a large swathe of, that could be a lot of help. But no, his statements basically got him fired, and the various honorary titles and awards he'd been given were pulled back, which seems kind of dumb, because they're awarded for work that is done, not for things you said that they now disagree with after the fact. This brings us to the next thing, which is all about scientific paper fraud, and mostly the argument that the way publications are written, that is being structured, clear and concise, and doesn't provide the necessary understanding and insight as to what led to the publication. Yeah, there's a reason why articles are concise and to the point. Originally, it was for a much better reason, that is, there was a physical limitation on the amount of space in a printed journal. You couldn't afford to ramble on and rant about whatever you wanted prior to getting to your actual content. As such, you had to be clear, concise, and to the point. In modern terms, where the vast majority of publications are entirely online, you do have a better ground to argue that there should be a uh, larger amount of content before you actually get into the substance of a paper so when someone can understand how did you went from idea A to conclusion of idea Z. You need to look at the entire alphabet in between. It's not exactly necessary to be true, but it would be nice to better understand the thought process and how people get to where they do. The current structure, particularly the bit they're complaining about, that being the results, is arguably the part that needs to be concise and to the point. Arguably, the two most important parts of any research paper are going to be the methods and the results. Primarily the methods to start with, because once you look at that, you can think, Okay, these methods are justified, they make sense, and they're consistent with everything else, and particularly for the application they're being used for, they are working. Then you look at the results and go, these results make sense in light of that method. Therefore, whatever they discuss, and whatever comes before, sure, nice fluff. But you don't need to go into other greater details in the results section, because all anyone wants to know is, what did you get out of this thing? What are the results, and are they going to be something that I need to look into for whatever I want to do? You don't need to have an entire stream of consciousness for results. Admittedly, sometimes a stream of consciousness is just what you want, particularly when we look at how AI has failed in a really hilarious and dumb way in writing a case study for what appears to be Elsevier. Yeah, Elsevier, the company that went public recently, the one that's going to have to report back to its shareholders as to why it accepted a really dodgy, dodgy case report. Something that opens with, I'm very sorry, but I don't have access to real-time information or patient-specific data as I am an AI language model. Oops, given the title is A Successful Management of an Iatrogenic Portal Vein Hepatic Artery Injury in a Four-Month-Old Female Patient, a Case Report and Literature Review. Is this four-month-old female patient imaginary by any chance? Are these people even doctors, or is this just a psychotic break in which they have left any semblance of reality and instead have chosen to try and make it up as best they can? Poorly done, science director in Elsevier. Poorly done. But worse yet, it appears to have been cited by at least four people, who clearly never bothered to read it or are incapable of reading it. The final news item we have for you is slightly disappointing, but at least good news in some ways. 
Voyager 1 has, to an extent, resumed communication with Earth again. Voyager 1 is just about completely left our solar system has been traveling for decades now. It's roughly 15 billion miles or 24 billion kilometers from Earth at present. It takes about a day for any data that it sends to reach us on Earth. And that's a problem because recently it stopped communicating. And not like your ex ghosts you or an angry teenager locks themselves in their room. Uh, no, in this case, this is more like uh, your father went off to buy milk and cigarettes and never came back, kind of, it stopped communicating. And that was a worry, because once it stops, we can't do anything. It's quite literally in space, so far away that there is nothing to be done. It is lost. It is a lonely probe sent so far out that, well, it's gone. What we do now have, given its resumed communication, is some idea about what's happened. It seems the transmitter shut off one of two, thankfully, and because of this, it had to go into a safety mode. Now that safety mode's been lifted, and it's communicating, but we don't know why that happened. It could be, for example, it's overdrawing its power supply, and that's why it's decided to shut down that system. Or it could be that any number of other things have gone wrong, and it's going to take weeks, if not months, for NASA to be able to slowly troubleshoot it, and eventually identify what the fault is, and if, and that's a massive if, it could possibly and very vaguely be fixed remotely. For now, Voyager 1 relies entirely on its S-band transmitter, and understand this is not ideal because that particular transmitter has a far worse signal, or at least ability to broadcast signal, and as such we get a much weaker signal from it and it can only theoretically just pick it up. And that was a major concern until now. Could we even identify it, let alone get usable data out of it? Thankfully, yes, we can, for now. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.